started. I'm Don Farish, president here at Roger Williams, and thank you all for being here today. I want to introduce our, our speaker and give you a little bit of context. Um, our speaker is uh, Professor Carol Delaney, uh, Professor Emeritus, Professor Emerita uh, at Stanford University. Uh, Professor Delaney received her undergraduate degree in philosophy from Boston University, a master's in theology from Harvard, and a PhD um, from the University of Chicago. She is, by nature, a cultural anthropologist, and she's written uh, a number of books, a very distinguished scholar. Several years ago, became interested in uh, the story of Columbus, and particularly his religious background and, and, and focus, um, and spent seven years writing a book that was published in 2011 and named one of the 100 best books of the year. Uh, she's here today, uh, thanks very much to uh, two of our Board of Trustees members, Arlene Violet and um, Mary Gabelli. Uh, we have a couple of other board members here as well. Um, the program will be roughly 45 minutes, and then we'll open to q and I will moderate the Q&A session, and I'll tell you ahead of time we'll do this. Everyone who wants to ask a question will have a chance to ask a question, but we're not going to go to the same person until everybody has an answered one question or asked one question. So, uh, looking forward to a, um, a, a spirited afternoon. And with that, let me introduce Professor Carol Delaney. Thank you very much, uh, President Ferris, for that very generous introduction. I have to say I'm delighted to be here and have had the opportunity to see your beautiful campus. It's really lovely. And I want to um, thank all of you, and particularly the students, for coming here. Um, can people hear in the back? No. Oh, okay. I would especially like to thank all the students for coming. Um, today uh, uh, during these contentious times. Let me begin by saying that I am very much in favor of an indigenous people's day, but as an anthropologist, I think we have to do a lot more. I'd like to see the whole country devote the next few years learning about the more than 300 native groups who are living in our midst. And I think it should be ongoing, and I think it should start in grade school. But people also need to learn more about Columbus because he's not the man that most people think he is. So I support an indigenous people's day, but not as a replacement for Columbus Day. And this talk will explain why. I hope you'll bear with me. I think you're gonna hear some things that you've never heard before. And at the end, we're gonna have lots of time, I hope, for discussion. Most people, even professors, know very little about Columbus. Very few has, have read his diary, his letters, and his memos. Before I began my research, I too knew hardly anything about him except in 1492, he sailed the ocean blue. I really knew nothing more than that, and I never thought I would write a book about him. So here's how it began. In the fall of 1999, I was teaching a class at Stanford called Millennial Fever. And um, in order to look at the apocalyptic frenzy that was going on in the United States at that time, and the students were probably too young to have experienced that. Um, but what the class was also exploring the history of apocalyptic millennial thought in the religions. And in one of the readings, I came across a tiny footnote to Columbus's apocalyptic millennial beliefs. I had never heard of them nor had any of the professors of history at Stanford heard about those either. I was stunned. I guess it's not so surprising, however, since more than 20 years ago, theologian scholar by the name of Leonard Sweet wrote, and I quote, and when I do this, it means I'm quoting. He quoted, he, he wrote, scholars most interested in millennialism have, hardly, have largely ignored Columbus. Those scholars most interested in Columbus have skipped over his millennialism because to delve into it would mean taking a medieval journey into mysticism, dreams, visions, poetry, monasticism, crusading ideology, prophecies, messianic illusions, apocalypticism, and millennialism, a journey few academics have wished to take. 
But I was willing to do so because my academic work has focused on religion critically. I started to read about some books about Columbus and quickly became dissatisfied because none of them mentioned his religious beliefs and certainly not his apocalyptic beliefs. He would seem to be treated as if he was just like us and only his clothes and his ships were different. The goal of cultural anthropology is to try to understand people in their own cultural context because that's what influences the way they act and the way they think. For example, my own anthropological fieldwork was conducted in a small village on top of a mountain in Turkey, where I lived for two years in a mud brick hut with no water, running water, no electricity, and a hole in the ground for a toilet. It was enclosed. The people were mostly illiterate shepherds and farmers. And it became very clear to me that Islam was not a religion in the way we think about it as a belief system dealing with a certain aspect of our lives, but the very context in which they lived. It provided their worldview. And the same was true for Columbus. At that time, the concept of a religion, one among others, and each with a name, did not exist. So for instance, Hinduism, Buddhism, the isms were attached or it was only a, it was a 19th century invention. Modernity is what transformed what were different worldviews and ways of life into entities that deal with a specific aspect, namely spirituality. Columbus lived in a Christian Catholic world that enveloped his life. The Protestant Reformation had not yet happened, and for him and his peers, the Catholic religion was the one true and only religion. Anything else was considered a false sect. Anthropologists generally study living cultures, but if the past is another country, as the saying goes, it seemed possible I could visit Columbus's world. So I began to read a lot about 14th and 15th century Europe to get a sense of the world into which he was born. The following will set the stage, so please try to put yourself into his world. First, the universe was very small, and the Earth was at the center. The sun, the moon, and the stars went around the Earth. Second, they thought the Earth had only three parts, Africa, Asia, and Europe, and thought to be peopled by the three sons of Noah. Jerusalem was at the center, where the three parts met. See Jerusalem in the center. For Catholics, Jerusalem was sacred, not just because it was the place where Jesus preached and was crucified, but also where he would return at the end time to usher in the last days. It was an outrage that was in Muslim hands. Although a number of crusades had been launched to recapture it, none had succeeded. As a boy, Columbus witnessed a crusade when it was leaving from Genoa. And I think that's where he may have gotten his first idea about this. Before the end of the world, Jerusalem had to be in Christian hands so the temple could be rebuilt, for that was where Christ would come to judge and the believers would be raptured up to hell, to heaven, excuse me, <laughs> would be raptured to heaven. <laughs> um, it was the duty of Christians to evangelize and thus try to convert non-Christians so they would be saved. Five, people believed there were only seven millennia to the world's existence, one millennium for each day of creation. And people thought the end was near. Even before he had the idea of his voyage, Columbus had figured out how many years were left. And he revisited that issue much later, which I'll get to talk about when he wrote his own book of prophecies. I think that's a enough background for now but I hope that gives you some sense of the world into which he was born in 1451 in Genoa. People feared the end was near because of a number of events that had occurred in Europe during the 14th and 15th centuries. There was a terrible famine and then the bubonic plague took the lives of between 25 and 50 million people and there were outbreaks of it all the time. There was also a schism in the Catholic Church when there was a pope in Avignon and one in Rome. And that was very, very upsetting and thought to be toward the end. And that schism was not resolved until the beginnings of the 15th century. 
But the capstone to all of these turbulent events was the conquest of Constantinople in 1453, two years after Columbus was born. This was devastating, especially to the Genoese, because they had a huge trading colony in Constantinople, and many of them were killed, and those who came home had terrific, horribly, horrible stories to tell. So Muslims were clearly in the ascendant, which added to the sense of doom. Now they blocked not only the overland pilgrimage route to Jerusalem, but cut off the trade route to the riches of the East that had been established by the Franciscans and also especially by Marco Polo. Columbus's copy of Polo's Travels is well annotated and is one of the nine books from his library that still exist. Marco Polo, as well as the Franciscans, believed that the Grand Khan of Cathay, what we would now think of as China, was interested in Christianity and he had asked for friars to be sent to teach the people and himself in the religion. And some, of the, some people like Polo, Marco Polo and Columbus began to think that perhaps the Grand Khan could be persuaded to launch a crusade from the east while the Europeans came from the west to get Jerusalem. With the overland route to the west blocked, people thought that the only way to get there was to sail around Africa and into the Indian Ocean. And that was the path that the Portuguese had been pursuing, and Columbus sailed with them on a number of occasions. But he was also beginning to think of a way to go west, across the ocean, because Marco Polo had said that the Asian continent was so wide that obviously the ocean must be very narrow. So that was the picture of the world at the time, sort of a narrow little ocean. While sailing with the Portuguese, Columbus had experienced westerly currents and winds as they passed the Canary Islands and thought that would be the place to start the westward crossing. But the Portuguese king was not interested. Columbus did not give up. He sent his brother to England to see if Henry VII would support it while he went to Spain. His wife had died and now Columbus and his young son Diego was in tow and together they sailed to the port of Palos de Frontera from where, seven years later, the first voyage would depart. They arrived sometime in the summer of 1485 and climbed up to the Franciscan monastery of La Rabida. Columbus had always been partial to the Franciscans and his friends noted that he was a passionate man of ardent faith. For example, Bartolome de las Casas, whom you probably know about, and I'll say more about him later, knew Columbus and said this about his faith. He observed the fasts of the church most faithfully, confessed and made communion often, read the canonical offices like a member of a religious order, hated blasphemy and swearing, and was most devoted to Our Lady and St. Francis, and was grateful to God for benefits received, and especially devoted to the idea that God would deem him worthy of aiding somewhat in recovering the Holy Sepulchre. Columbus and Diego were well received at La Rabida and lived there for several years while the monks worked on getting him an audience with Queen Isabella. I have actually visited La, La Rabida and um, the monks there are very proud of their connection with Columbus and have preserved several rooms where he lived and stayed uh, during that time basically intact. Columbus finally met Isabella in May of 1846. She was clearly taken with him because she too was partial to the Franciscans and was also interested in the recovery of Jerusalem as her grandfather and uncle had made that trip. And I think she had wanted also to go. She was quick to agree with Columbus's plan because the Pope had given to Portugal all the land along the coast of Africa, as well as the right to enslave any Muslims or pagans they encountered. That decree is known as Romanus Pontifex. Isabella had to submit Columbus's proposal to a committee for further study. It would be a long wait. During this time, Columbus met Beatrice de Harana, and though the daughter of peasants, she was educated and could read and write, which were qualities that Columbus uh, appealed to Columbus. And they soon became a couple, and their son Fernanda, uh, Ferdinand was born in 1488. In 1490, the commission rejected Columbus's proposal. And so did a second commission. 
Columbus had been waiting for six years and thinking about this project for a decade. So he decided to go to France and was already on the road when a confidant of the queen rushed to find him and brought him back, telling Isabella she was losing a great opportunity at little cost. She signed the papers in April 19, uh, 19, 1492 and told the people of Palos to prepare the ships for the voyage. As you know, these were the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. I'm not going into the details of the immense task involved in getting the ships ready or finding 87 men who would go on this perilous journey. Before departing, Isabella gave Columbus a letter of friendly greeting to the Grand Khan, if and when they should meet. And once underway, Columbus began to keep a diary, very unusual at the time, since not all sailors could read and write. And if they did, they just jotted down the wind and the direction and the speed. But at the beginning, he re in his diary, he recapitulated his understanding of the voyage. He wrote that he hoped he would meet the person who is called Grand Khan, which means in our Spanish language, King of Kings, to see how their conversion to our holy faith might be undertaken. Because so many times he had asked for men learned in our holy faith in order that they might instruct him in it and how the Holy Father had never provided them. And thus so many people were lost falling into idolatry and accepting false and harmful sects. And you commanded that I should not go to the east by way of land, but by the route to the west, by which route we do not know for certain anyone has previously passed. The purpose of the voyage was to set up a trading post to obtain gold and spices that would finance the crusade. There was absolutely no intention of killing or enslaving people belonging to the greatest empire in the world. Finally, on August 3rd, 1492, the small fleet slipped away from Palos into the unknown. Columbus was confident and began to think of himself as the Christ bearer, like his namesake, St. Christopher, carrying the Christian religion across the waters. But the men were afraid they might run out of food before they reached land and maybe also run into monstrous races described by Pliny. Their anxiety was increased when the rudder of the Pinta came loose on the way to the Canaries, and then there was an eruption of a volcano on Tenerife. These were not good omens. But finally they set out on the uncharted ocean, sailing due west, for Columbus thought that Chipango, which is his name, or was the name for Japan, it was at the same latitude as the Canaries. And once they arrived at Japan, they knew that China was not very far away. Late in September, they got entangled in the Sargasso Sea and saw some birds, so they thought they might be getting close to land. But the crew became anxious and demanded that if they did not find land within three days, they should turn around before they ran out of food. Amazingly, in the next couple of days, there were more signs that they were getting close. Late at night on October 11, Rodrigo de Tirana, on board the Pinta, called out, land, land and they sat out the night in great anticipation. Their vigil was rewarded because early in the morning, a veil of mist opened and Columbus and the crew saw an island full of green trees and abounding in springs with a large lagoon in the middle. All of these will be Columbus quotes unless I specify differently. Columbus was relieved. He had crossed an ocean no one thought possible and done so in 33 days, a feat that few sailors in small boats today have surpassed and instinctively chose the route that such sailors still continue to follow. Now, October 12 is the date Columbus wrote in his diary, but he was using the Julian calendar, whereas we use the Gregorian that was not established until 1582. Between the two calendars is a 10-day difference. So our holiday is actually commemorating a day when he was still at sea. So one suggestion is maybe Indigenous Peoples Day should be October 22nd, which is the day he actually landed in our calendar. The crew scrambled ashore, kissed the ground, and thanked God for bringing them safely across the great water. And Columbus called it San Salvador for their salvation. Soon, a multitude of people hastened to the shore, astounded and marveling at the ships. Columbus's impulse toward the native people was one of benevolence and friendship, motivated by a concern for their conversion. 
I, in order that they should be friendly to us because I recognized that they were a people who would be better freed and converted to our holy faith by love than by force. I gave them red caps and glass beads and many other things in which they took much pleasure and became so much our friends that it was a marvel. The natives came swimming to the ships and brought us parrots and cotton thread and many other things and they traded them to us. Then his description of the people, reflecting an almost anthropological attention to detail, writing what, what he saw with his own eyes. All of them go around naked as their mothers bore them. They are very well formed with handsome bodies and good faces. Their hair is coarse, almost like the tail of a horse, except for a short little bit in the back which they wear long. The natives on their side must have been astonished to see such heavily dressed men with full beards, since they themselves had very little facial hair. Columbus marveled at their small swift boats that he would soon call by the native name canoe. We now know they'd arrived in the Bahamas, but Columbus imagined they'd landed on one of the many islands, well, go back to that, when one of the many islands that uh, Marco Polo had uh, talked about. And so he was eager to continue to find the land of the Grand Khan. So they continued on passing islands, all very green with sweet smelling breezes. Columbus's eyes pained him and his descriptions give a sense of the therapeutic beauty of their value. I also walked among those trees which were more beautiful to see than any other thing that has ever been seen. I do not know where to go first, nor do my eyes grow tired of seeing such beautiful verdure and so different from ours and the smell of the flowers or trees that came from the land was so good and soft, it was the sweetest thing in the world. He was overwhelmed not only by the beauty of the trees and flowers, but also the fish and the birds, and uses the word marvel and marvelous too many times to count. He also marveled at the natives' houses, and especially at their hammocks, which would soon solve the sleeping problems of sailors because his own sailors had to find, just sleep and find any place on the deck. They had no hammocks. So surely the hammock was one of the great gifts of the natives to the Europeans. Columbus also understood they were not speaking gibberish, as so many Europeans attributed to primitive peoples. But it was one language, and he began to learn some words, vowing that little by little I will progress in understanding and will have this tongue taught to persons of my household. They headed toward a large island called Cuba, which he thought might be Chipango, Japan, and thus thought he would soon reach China, because he wrote, I have decided to go to Kinsai and give your highness's letters to the Grand Khan. Columbus noticed how generous the natives were and demanded from his men that they, there be an exchange of goods. And this would become a common refrain as the sailors, when they went on land, were rapacious. But while he had them in his control, he, he said, I did, not control, I did not allow anything to be taken, not even the value of a pin. With gestures, the people told him with words that, and, and some words that other people, some fierce one-eyed natives with snouts of dogs who ate men, and as soon as they came, that one was taken and they cut his throat and drank his blood and cut off his genitals. These were called Caribs. The natives called these other people Caribs. In early December, he reached Haiti, which he named Hispaniola. And when the natives came aboard, he ordered that they should be treated courteously because they are the best and most gentle people in the world. And especially because I have much hope in our Lord that their, your highnesses will make all of them Christians. But he was becoming very annoyed with the sailors when he sent them ashore to explore and compared them unfavorably with the dignity and generosity of the na natives. News of his arrival traveled fast, and soon he received an invitation from Guacanagari, chief of another area. On December 24th, they set out in his direction, but they arrived late, and they anchored outside the harbor to wait out the night. The person on watch was careless, and before dawn, Columbus felt his ship go aground, and he named the place Navidad because it was born from the Santa Maria. They were unable to save the ship. Now they had only the tiny Nina, as the captain of the Pinta had taken off. 
hoping he would be the one to find the gold. As soon as Guacanagari saw what had happened, he sent his people to help unload the Santa Maria and stored their goods in a place that he had emptied for them. Columbus invited him for dinner on the board the Nina, but the chief had already ordered a feast for the men, and he and Columbus exchanged gifts. Robert Fusson, one translator of Columbus's diary, wrote, <clears throat> Columbus expresses nothing but love and admiration for the Indians. His affection for the young chief, Guacanagari, and vice versa, is one of the most touching stories of love, trust, and understanding between men of different races and cultures to come out of this period in history. Columbus had equally effusive praise for the islanders. I believe in, that in this world there are no better people or better land. They love their neighbors like themselves, and they have the sweetest speech in the world and are gentle and always laughing. To him, they already seemed to be natural Christians, and he hoped that friars would be sent to teach them so they would become true Christians and thus saved. But more serious things were imminent. With only the tiny Nina, it was clear some men would have to be left behind while he returned to Spain to get a rescue ship. He wrote in his diary that when he returned, he hoped to find a barrel of gold that those who had left behind would have acquired by exchange and that they would have found the gold mine and the spicery and those things in such quantity that the sovereigns before three years are over will undertake and prepare to go conquer the holy sepulcher. For thus I urged your highnesses to spend all the profits on this my enterprise on the conquest of Jerusalem. The phrase for thus I urged implies they'd already discussed the ultimate goal. Columbus told the men who would remain to strip the Santa Maria and build some lodgings for themselves and ordered them to do no harm to the people and to respect Chief Guacanagari, to whom they owed so much. Guacanagari held a farewell feast inviting other chiefs to attend. On January 4, 1493, Columbus said a sad goodbye to the chief and the men who would have to be left behind. He also took six of the natives one of whom was a relative of the chief, and he said more wanted to come. They were definitely not slaves. On their way, they caught up with Pinzon, the captain of the Pinta, who had captured four native men and two young girls by force, and Columbus ordered that they be returned to their homes. And they were. Sometime later, they met a very fierce group of natives who attacked them with bows and arrows. These were the Caribs, and the natives on board were definitely afraid of them. Columbus noticed that their language, their hairstyles, and body ornamentation were different, as was their demeanor. One scholar believes that the most advanced concept Columbus offered was that of a cultural region unified by language and customs, obviously aware that not all of the people he was encountering were the same. It was a stormy crossing, and they arrived back in Palos on the Ides of March, 1493, and spent several days at La Rabida to recuperate. But news of their return spread rapidly, and they were summoned to Barcelona, where the sovereigns were holding court. Columbus prepared the natives for the long journey, taking every care they would be comfortable. They had never ridden a donkey or seen a donkey, but they all rode by donkey to Barcelona. When they arrived, the sovereigns held a reception in public view. Then it is said that Columbus quietly and modestly related the highlights of his journey and discoveries and presented the six natives to them. A few days later, the natives were baptized with the king, queen, and Columbus standing as godparents. Columbus's godson became his loyal interpreter and accompanied him on many of his other explorations. At least one of them remained at court for the rest of his life, and the others cho chose to return home. None of them were enslaved. Despite all the fanfare, Columbus was anxious to get about the men back in Hispaniola, and he had no trouble convincing Isabella to launch a second voyage. But she quickly alerted the Pope, Alexander VI. As God's emissary in the world, he felt he had the right to bestow on Christians territories that were in the hands of non-Christians. So on May 3rd, 1493, he issued a papal bull called Inter Caterer, acknowledging that since he'd given regions in Africa to the Portuguese, he could now bestow the area newly discovered by Columbus on the Spaniards. Although bestowing lands was meant to be about establishing a trade monopoly, 
basically telling other people to keep off, other European people to cough, keep off, I think there's ambiguity. Because the very next day, realizing that was enough, the Pope issued another, and he drew a line from the north to the south down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And the side on, the, one side with the African side was given to the Portuguese, and now the other side to the Spanish. And granted the Spanish sovereigns the right to freely take corporal possession of the said island and countries and hold them forever. The Portuguese were outraged and some adjustments were made. But nonetheless, we must be astonished that the Pope thought he could divide up the world among European nations. In addition, according to papal policy, anyone who resisted Christianization or committed acts against nature, cannibalism or sodomy, could be enslaved. This is to emphasize that Catholic Christianity is intimately involved with everything that happened in the New World. Yet no one seems to be condemning the church for its position and its involvement in all of this. <clears throat> and I think they should. Soon Isabella approved another much, much bigger voyage, 17 ships. There were sailors and settlers and some Hidalgos, also Ponce de Leon, the future discoverer of Florida, Michel de Cuneo, whose descriptions of the voyage and the settlement survive. There were three Fran Franciscans and a Benedictine friar whose job was to convert the natives, but he did absolutely nothing. Columbus's brother Diego and the father of Bartolome de las Casas were also aboard. Along the way, they discovered Guadalupe, on which lived some of the fierce Caribs, and they learned that they had captured people from the group that Columbus knew, had eaten the men, made the women concubines, and castrated the boys. And there were reports, at least, of the castration business, um, written reports by some of the people who saw this. Columbus rescued as many as he could and took them back to their homes. They also discovered Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and were encountered by more fierce, by more fierce Caribs and their enslaved people. As they approached Guacanagari's village, they saw a shocking sight. Several lifeless bodies were floating in the water. When they landed, they learned that all of the men who had been left behind were dead. The friar immediately wanted revenge and told Columbus to go kill Guacanagari and his people. But Columbus did not believe it was Guacanagari's doing. With his native godson, Columbus went to see Guacanagari and learned, as he imagined, that the men had begun to fight among themselves, formed into groups that went on raiding parties, belonging to another chief, chief had raped the women and stolen things. The chief then came and killed all the men. The relationship between Columbus and Guacanagari remained friendly for the rest of the time that he was there. But the new settlers blamed Columbus and their relationship with him deteriorated. So he decided it would be better to move on and they sailed to a place Columbus called La Isabella. There was much work to do, build houses, storeroom, gardens, etc. But immediately there were problems with the Hidalgos. They refused to work and also refused to let Columbus use their horses to haul timber and stone, which put, which put a huge burden on the other settlers. In addition, these men expected that the natives would be their servants. Columbus heard about a gold mine in a place called Sabao, which he thought might be Sheba, and sent some of them to check it out. At the same time, some of the Hidalgos returned to Spain with some spices and 26 of the supposed man-eating Caribs, who, because of that crime against nature, they could be enslaved according to the Pope's policy. Nevertheless, Columbus requested they be treated better than other slaves and given instruction in the faith so that at least they would secure the welfare of their souls. But he also said that if any natives at La Isabella worked for the Spaniards, they should be paid as employees of the crown. He was clearly disappointed with his own men, but eager to go exploring to find the Grand Khan. So he put a man named Margaret in charge and left specific instructions about what to do and how to treat the natives. And I've seen these instructions, they still exist. Marguerite and his men were cruel and without Columbus's knowledge, rounded up a large group and sent them back to Spain with a number of the disaffected Hidalgos. 
and then, who then complained to the sovereigns that Columbus was being too strict with them. Meanwhile, Columbus was exploring farther to the west, and when he came to what is now Cuba, he thought it must be the beginning of the mainland, adjacent to the noble region of Cathay. In other words, not too far from the Grand Khan. But when they'd been gone a long time, but they had been gone a long time and were running out of food, so they headed back to La Isabella. On the way, a fleet of elaborately decorated canoes came out to meet him. The chief of the group greeted Columbus. Friend, I have decided to leave my homeland and come with you to Castile and see the king and queen of the world. And Columbus said, he said this so reasonably, I was wonderstruck. But due to a storm approaching, he persuaded them to wait for his next visit. When he got back to La Isabella, he found that his brother Bartholomew had arrived, but also learned about what Marguerite had done. Because of the false rumors he had sent about Columbus, Isabella was concerned, and so in the next shipment of supplies for the um, settlement, she requested that he return to discuss the situation. At that time, he felt he couldn't leave because many of the men were sick, but he asked her to send good friars who would come, to, who would learn the language and instruct and not just baptize the natives in the religion. He also requested they send good miners to work in the mines, which for Las Casas was proof that Columbus never intended to make the natives work in the mines. Finally, in March 1496, he did retain, 1496, he returned to Spain with more than 200 of the Christians and 30 of the natives who had been rounded up by Marguerite. Perhaps due to his remorse or his penance for how the natives had been treated in his absence, Columbus now donned the coarse brown habit knotted with a cord of a Franciscan friar. He had become a lay monk in the Observatine order, and he wore this outfit for the rest of his life, and it became his burial shroud. Columbus the monk, it is hardly the, the image that we have of this man. The Indians with him were baptized and thus not enslaved. He petitioned the sovereigns to send another voyage, and this time they authorized the construction of a new settlement, and in a clear departure from their earlier idea of a trading post to make grants of land to the settlers. This was the beginning of the imperial designs on the New World, but it also changed their previous promise to Columbus, for whom the trading post was to be under his control, and he was supposed to receive a certain percentage. Finally, on May 30th, 1498, he set sail on the third voyage. Three ships would go with him and sail farther south, while three others would go straight to Hispaniola. Unfortunately, those went off course and landed on the far side of the island, where there was a rebel group under a man named Roldan, and they were holed up there. Roldan and the men with him went on rampages, raping and pillaging. All of this was unknown to Columbus, who was sailing along what is now Panama, Venezuela, and the north coast of South America. Along that coast, he thought he was near the terrestrial paradise, or the Garden of Eden, the discovery of which was believed to be, by many, to be a sign that the end time was near. In the meantime, the sovereigns had sent Francisco de Babudia to the settlement to check on the situation. It was a terrible choice as he had already a reputation for being harsh and had been sued by the citizens of the towns that he commanded in Spain. When Babadilla got to La Isabella, he saw that two Spaniards had been hung. Columbus had ordered their deaths because those men had done terrible things to the natives, and he wanted to set an example that such behavior would not be tolerated. But his job was to go to exploring and to find the Grand Khan. He thought the men which in charge would follow his instructions, but they just did whatever they wanted and are responsible for the terrible things that occurred. Here, I, a short digression. I would like to say that as far as we know, Columba never killed a native, took a native woman, or had a slave. Yet Bartolome de las Casas, who is revered as the defender of the Indians, had slaves, had several encomiendas that were worked by slaves, and did not begin to change his mind about slavery until years after Columbus's death. But then it was only about the indigenous people of the Caribbean, because he suggested that the colonists should import blacks from Africa. 
So that's the great defender of the Indians. When Columbus finally arrived back at La Isabella, Bobadilla captured him and put him in chains. His brothers were already enchained and on board a ship ready to return to Spain. Columbus knew nothing of this, and when the guards came to get him, he feared they were going to behead him. Instead, they were all sent back to Spain, but on different ships. With Columbus out of the way, Bobadilla took up residence in Columbus's house, confiscated all of his belongings, and told his men they could take all the gold and women they wanted, and under his rule, many more natives were killed. Back in Spain, the queen ordered the chains be removed, told Columbus she'd not ordered his capture, and promised to replace Bobadilla. Shortly, she sent Nicolas Ovando, 35 ships and 2,500 colonists, and appointed him governor over the lands Columbus had discovered, thus stripping Columbus of that title. While recuperating, Columbus turned his attention to the spiritual matter he considered of utmost importance, the apocalyptic significance of his discoveries. He wrote, here begins the book or handbook of sources, statements, and prophecies on the subject of the recuperation of God's holy city and Mount Zion, and on the discovery and evangelization of the islands of the Indies and of all other peoples and nations. This came to be known as the Book of Prophecies. The book was written in Latin, and it's the most explicit and extensive expression of his quest for the liberation of Jerusalem. It remained unpublished for 400 years, and then only a few copies of the Latin version were published. Not until 1992, during the quincentennial, was it published in English. Very few people have ever heard about it, let alone read it. I have. For years, Columbus had been collecting passages from the Bible and other religious sources, which showed that him that the discovery of violence was foretold and a sign of the impending end of the world. For example, God says, I will set a sign among them to the islands afar off, to them that have not heard of me and have not seen my glory. And next to important passages, Columbus drew a finger pointing to it, the way we would either underline or put a post-it. While Ovando was lording it over La Isabella, Columbus was allowed to make a fourth voyage, but he had only four ships and 135 men. Isabella warned him he could not stop at Hispaniola, the very island he had discovered. He took his 12-year-old son, Ferdinand, with him. He made the fastest crossing ever, and though he was not supposed to go to Hispaniola, a severe hurricane was brewing. He requested permission to land and warned those returning to Spain with Bobadilla about the hurricane. He was refused permission to land, and Bobadilla scoffed at the warning. Too bad. Bobadilla and all his men went down with the ship, while Columbus and his ships rode it out. Columbus sailed past Cuba across the Caribbean to Panama, from which he hoped to return to Hispaniola, but they never made it. They were shipwrecked on Jamaica. They had no food, but Columbus kept the men aboard the ship so they would not go on their rapacious errands. And instead, since he knew these natives from a previous stop and they had been friendly, they set up a trading exchange. But knowing this could not last, Columbus sent a few men in canoes to try to paddle to Hispaniola to get a rescue ship. When one of the canoes reached land, they heard that Ovando was close and they went to meet him. There they learned about one of the most horrendous acts committed by Ovando or by anybody on the islands. He had burned or hanged 84 native chiefs and other nobles, along with Anaconda, chief, the chief lady of the land, whom all the natives obeyed and served. And she had actually invited all those chiefs to welcome Ovando, and that was his response. He committed more atrocities than Bobadilla, and yet their names and those of Marguerite and Roldan are forgotten, and instead it's Columbus who's blamed for their terrible deeds. Finally, a rescue ship, a ship arrived, and on June 29, 1504, all of the men, as well as teenage Ferdinand, bid farewell to Jamaica. They had been marooned for a year and a half. Not long after, they returned to Spain. Columbus was ill and very disturbed by what all the Spaniards had done. <coughs> Excuse me. 
He, was soon, he soon found out that Isabella had died, and thus he was unable to tell her of the perfidiousness of those who had been sent to govern in his place. King Ferdinand was not interested and reneged on all of the privileges that they had bestowed on Columbus before the first voyage. And we're almost at the end. Columbus was naturally concerned about his family and the natives he had come to know. He spent the remaining year of his life trying to reclaim some of his rights so that they could be provided for. He left funds to support four men of religion to go and teach and not just baptize the natives so they would be saved. And also for some buildings to uh, be constructed. But his passion for the, col for the conquest of Jerusalem never left him, and he left money in a bank in Genoa for that purpose stating that when it had multiplied and was sufficient for the venture, the sovereign should undertake it, or if they were uninterested, his son Diego should do it. Then on May 20th, 1506, the Feast of the Ascension, according to his sons and friends who were at his bedside, Columbus with his dying breath said, into thy hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. He was 56. Thank you. Okay, it's time for the audience to respond. So who, who has a question or comment? Danny? Dr. Delaney, you mentioned that Columbus is not directly responsible for some of the atrocities he committed. For example, in on page 238 of your book, his men disobeyed his orders in one instance and went on rampages, of which he continuously compa complained. Are you aware that Columbus expressed intent to enslave pe native peoples? It appears to me that the people are ingenuous and would be good servants, and I am an opinion that they would very readily become Christians, as they appear to have no religion. If it pleases our Lord, I intend to in turn to return to carry sit home six of them to your highness. That's from Columbus's journal, the 11th to 12th of October, 19, 1492. How do you reconcile this reality with your assertion? Furthermore, as a leader, if he disagreed with these acts, wouldn't his position of power exert some sort of influence on the people he led? Thank you for that. As I've said, the six people uh, were not enslaved. They, one of them became his godson. The other one stayed there at the court uh, for the rest of his life. The others were turned home. He had made that statement because of something that he was urged to do on the behalf of some of the other people who were there. But he, then none of, he never enslaved anybody. No. No, his purpose also oh. was never to enslave anybody. They were going to meet the Grand Khan. So so, not enslave the Grand Khan's people. Can I, can I ask a point of clarification then from his journal? Um, he uses the word servants. I intend to carry six of them home. They'll make good servants. Servants is not the same as a slave. S so in the 15th, 16th century, it is often used interchangeably. Well, apparently that maybe is a bad translation then. They were never enslaved. They were not enslaved. Okay, thank you. And they were not actually made into uh, servants either because, you know, one became his, his traveling companion and one was at the court, yeah. Hello, um, Dr. Delaney, by now you must be aware that our institution has po uh, petitioned for Columbus Day to be changed to Indigenous Peoples Day. I hold the petitions right here in my hand. Um, and many other colleges and universities celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day instead of Columbus, like Cornell University, Harvard University, Syracuse University, University of Utah, and including Brown University, the school that you work at. Um, furthermore, the states of South Dakota, Minnesota, Alaska, California, and Vermont have officially adopted Indigenous Peoples Day instead as well as the cities of Oberlin, Oberlin, Ohio, Bangor, Maine, Seattle, Washington, and many more. The number of cities that celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day is over 55 so far. So is it your intent that your work will have a bearing on this movement? 
First of all, as I said right at the beginning, I'm totally in support of an Indigenous Peoples Day. And it should be much more than that, in fact. I think we could have a year of it, or a month, or a week, or something, but a day. And I just don't think it should be a replacement for Columbus's, Columbus Day. If it were Bobadilla or Ovando Day, yes, I would say immediately, because they were the ones who did horrible, horrible things. And I, as I said, the only person Columbus killed were two Spaniards who had done such bad things. So yeah, I'm in support of an Indigenous People Day. I don't like the idea of replacement. And I think part of the thing that's been going on in all the universities is no people know nothing about him. They've read nothing about him. They've not read his diary. Um, and I think that might change things. And especially if they read other things that first-hand reports, which is one of the, you know, a lot of the material that I saw about the horrible things that were going on and how he tried to stop it. So yeah, I'm in support of the day, but not as a replacement. And I'm in support of a lot more than just a day. I think that, you know, is just a token. I think we really need to learn a lot more. Hi. Um, so you've repeatedly said that Columbus never had slaves. However, he wrote in one of his journals, a hundred Castellanos are now easily obtained for a, wo for a woman as for a farm. And it is very general, and there are plenty of dealers who go about looking for girls. Those from nine to ten are now in demand, <laughs> suggesting that Where he did you sold find this. Where I'm did sorry? you find this? I found it on an article f online, but uh, I would like to know who it, who is by because I've never seen anything like that. That was a quote quote from Columbus's journal. I would no, it. I've read the journal. There's nothing like that in the journal. I'm sorry. Okay, well. Even if that is not a direct quote, there were many more allegations from other people on his voyages that he still sold young girls into sex slavery. So Absol how would you respond Absolutely to that? not. Absolutely not. You can see he's continually grabbing his own guys who were off doing that and saying, do not. And he brought them home to their houses. He did not engage in sex slavery. He never even took a woman, as far as we know. I, I, I don't know where you're getting that information, but it's, it's beyond belief. I'm sorry, I've read so much stuff by and about him and by all the people who were with him, and there's nothing like that that I have seen. I would really like the reference, and I, will, I would um, like to get it from you. Um, so the question that we have for you next is for you and uh, the audience at large. Um, so as students, we are committed to equity and social justice for all. As we learn more about the history not taught in schools, we know of the discrimination suffered by many groups from whom the U.S. is home, starting with the indigenous peoples and including Italian Americans. What do people need to see from us to communicate that we are pro-Italian American but anti-Columbus and that it is possible to do both things? Um, I guess I'm not, I think if anybody would really read the diaries and read some of the things, you, he's, he was a religious fanatic, there's no question. I, I'm opposed to those apocalyptic millennial views, but there are people today who have them, fanatical Christians who still have these ideas. Um, so I'm against those, those particular ideas, but I am not against Columbus. I think everything I've read by him and about him, I, I didn't think I'd like him. I ended up actually liking him for some of the things he did and some of the things he said and the way he treated people. So that's my... Sure, and thank you for that. Um, does anybody in the audience have anything? Because we would love to hear some things. We well, it's, it's not a choice. So we'll be... Well, we want to be able to present the fact that we're, we're not anti... Italian-American that were anti-Columbus. Um, and that we want to be able to communicate to the group as a whole um, and to people um, that we are able to do both things. Could I add one more thing? I was just thinking about it. After Columbus, um, I mean, he's the first one who came across the ocean, right? And Vespucci came across a couple of years later. So if it wasn't Columbus, it would have been Ves Amerigo Vespucci, for whom the continents are named. Um, and then the conquistadors who came, and their goal was really conquest. That was not Columbus's notion. It was not 
he was going to meet the Grand Khan to set up a trading post to do this whole you know, crusade thing. It was certainly not conquest. And those other people who came after, not Vespucci so much, but the conquistadors so, came after were so much worse. And the ones that he left, Ovando and Labadia, I mean, they were really awful. <laughs> Hello. Um, I would like to ask, you keep saying that we should have both days, so presuming that the information that you're providing is true and that he was a good person, closer, <laughs> that he did not take part in these atrocities, what purpose does the day serve if his end goal was to fund the conquest of Jerusalem? You even say that you disagree with his religiously fanatic beliefs, but that you somehow him like him, which, okay, fine, but what, they, what, what does this day commemorate if not for the discovery in, of America, which then ends up with the atrocities committed? Well, I think one of the things is he is the first person who crossed the ocean that nobody thought could be crossed, and it was a very courageous thing to have done, and if it had not been him, as I said, it would have been somebody else. Does this not ignore then we'd have Vespucci Day, probably. Does this not ignore the failed attempt of... What? Nord Does this not uh, ignore the failed attempt of the Nordic peoples who did so? They ended up dying in about a month. They went over. There, the, they did not cross across the wide ocean. They went up around Greenland and Iceland, maybe to Newfoundland. We don't know. They did not cross the ocean. Even so, they, that does. I think it's. A, I think it's study. quite an extraordinary feat. It's like the first thing that goes to the moon. I would not disagree with you. I believe that it was. Maybe we will have a day to commemorate the first landing on the moon. Maybe we do. I don't, I don't know whether we do or not. But, so as an explorer and as a discoverer, I would say, for that deed alone. Hi. Oh, sorry. So uh, I wanted to reference uh, a point you had made before. Uh, when another student came up and mentioned that uh, Columbus did not uh, Columbus did not uh, have slaves of his own, uh, but there are writings. This source is from Howard Zinn, who is a uh, actual uh, professor as well. He says that this uh, quote comes from Columbus's journals, and this says, uh, referencing the Native Americans, a quote from Columbus: "They do not bear arms and do not know them, for I showed them a sword." They took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. They have no iron. Their spears are made of cane. They would make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. He also wrote, this is Columbus, uh, as soon as I arrived in the Indies on the first island which I found, I took some of the natives by force in order that they might learn and might give me information of whatever there is in these parts. Uh, the Indians, Columbus supported, are so naive and so free with their possessions that no one who has not witnessed them would believe it. When you ask for something they have, they never say no. To the contrary, they offer to share with anyone. And he then writes back to Queen Isabella uh, that uh, in return he would bring them from his next voyage as much gold as they need and as many slaves as they ask. He was full of religious talk. Thus the eternal God, our Lord, gives victory to those who follow his way over apparent impossibilities. He seems to be referencing the subjugation of the Indian people, or the Native American people there, who we believe to be uh, of, uh, from islands near India, and subjugating them in order to mine gold and to gain their possessions, uh, really without anything that could be construed as actual consent by the Native people. So I wonder, what are your counter-arguments to what Zinn here seems to be saying with some uh, very... Uh, vetted, accurate research here, that Columbus was in fact aware of the ideology guiding the Spanish here? I have looked at Zinn's book. I was one of the ones I started to read. I thought it was terrible. I thought it had very little, um, I mean, I know he's a professor too, but I think it, he, I don't know where he got some of those quotes and sources, because there was no, I just didn't think it was a very good book, and I didn't think it was well, well researched. 
There are a lot of books out there by Columbus, about Columbus. And some of them are, are okay and some of them are not. And yes, he did talk about the weapons that they had were not very you know, good compared to the kinds that the, um, uh, that the Christians had, but that was not to subjugate and take them. I disagree. I'll have full disclosure. I'm a minister, I'm a Christian minister, and I'm the University Multi-Faith Chaplain here. And, I, and I'm also a historian. And I, you bring up, I think, one thing we haven't talked about that's a thesis in your book is that we have to put people within their context and understand the, the driving um, forces in their life. Uh, we, do, we even do that with Roger Williams here, although we esteem him immensely. We know that he was not always part of the solution with the indigenous peoples. He could be part of the problem, even though he had some of the best relationships with them. So here's my question as an historian. At what point do we begin to look at the analysis of co colonial, colonial genocide? Meaning that even in, and I'm a Christian, um, at some point in trying to propagate Christianity, we created a cultural and religious genocide on indigenous peoples. I, I say to my st students that I know, hey look, the first, the first religion here on, on the continental US was not Christianity, it was indigenous peoples understanding of creation. And we never take a look at that. So at what point can we stand back and say, you know, okay, maybe Columbus didn't do this, but at what point did that whole movement create another kind of genocide that uh, we still need to atone for? I'm just curious, because I know this is part of your book. Put them put in context. Um, I think I, I'm really disturbed by the word genocide, because when I look up the definition of genocide, it says a specific conscious intention to get rid of a certain group of people the way the Nazis did with the Jews. And that was certainly not Columbus's mind at all, to get rid of these people. He wanted to be friends with them, he wanted to set up a trading post so to convince them to you know, march on Jerusalem at the same time the, the um, Europeans were. So the word genocide really bothers me in this context. <laughs> because I'm also uh, have studied human rights history, so I know there's a lot of debate amongst historians because the word wasn't created until after World War II, and the Genocide Convention was not um, put into place until you no know, 1948. Can we say that anything that occurred before that was genocide? And we also define genocide, because I've read the conventions, and I've read the conventions on human rights, that we define it not only as killing people, but also killing culture. Um, the ability for people to live within their context. So uh, the Nazis went about um, uh, trying to completely eradicate Jewish culture. And so I think you can apply that term, and I agree, you, you've got to do it carefully, because it's a 20th century term. But I think you can talk about it in terms of trying to uh, convert uh, people uh, and to another faith that is not their own. And I, I just what I'm curious about is at what point can we analyze that so that we can not repeat the same kinds of things? Um, and, and at what point can we stand back and say, okay, this wasn't a cool thing. This, this wasn't a cool thing for to happen. And we understand the context, but here was the result of it. Thanks for taking my question. I really appreciate it. Um, I guess since I'm a critic of especially the Abrahamic religions, I've written a book, Abraham on Trial. I find the religions, they're all sort of arguing against the, each other, you know, the right word of God, and they're going to inherit the patrimony. And I'm basically opposed to them all. And I think we've got to start thinking about other humans. And do it, instead of up to God first, oh, let's thank God for this, instead of let's thank humans. And I discovered that when I was walking on the Camino de Santiago, they're always giving these prayers, let's thank God for the food. And I said, no, we've got to thank the farmers and the people who are making the wine and the people who are serving us. But all this sort of religiosity takes people's attention away that we should 
be focusing on each other. And I think nationalism is another thing that is being very, very bad for this sort of thing. Everybody wants their own nation instead of we are one world and one planet, soon to destroy it if it, things go the way they're going right now. Excuse me, Professor Delaney, I'd just like to ask a, a follow-up question to the one that just came. It seems to me that you did start to address that, this, this issue of, uh, of cultural genocide and, uh, and, you know, and laying the blame not on Columbus but on the Pope and the Catholic Church at the time which set up the, um, put a certain cast around, around the discovery and, there, and which set the stage for the conquest. And maybe you could address that. Um, well, it does seem that that's sort of a lot of what I was talking about, the yeah, whole yeah, notion. But, but I think, I think it, he was surrounded it by this notion of the crusade and you know that Jerusalem was the center and it had to be retaken. And um, that was the motivation, you know, that was the motivation behind everything. And, you know, that it is, it is a religious motivation. And that I'm opposed to, opposed to. So it's the religion aspect that I'm really opposed to and not the people who necessarily are having that. Hi. Um, in his journals, did Columbus ever talk about any natives who refused to convert to Christianity? And if so, how did he respond to that? He never tried to convert anybody. He was waiting for the friars to come to teach. And he kept saying, the, I mean, that one friar that was supposed to be sent to teach them didn't do anything. He didn't learn the language. He didn't teach them. And sometimes they, the friars or whoever they were would just baptize them without teaching them anything. And Columbus kept saying, no, I want friars to come and teach so they know what they're getting into. And no, he, there, there weren't, um, as far as I know, nobody was converted during that time. Before we get to the second question. Hi. Uh, you mentioned how Columbus was a monk. What culture of uh, religion does that stem from and what uh, did they believe in those monks? He became a Franciscan. Okay. He became a Franciscan. You know the robes they wear? Mm. They're brown, and they have a cord tied around. He became a Franciscan. Oh, okay, cool. That was for the first question, because I've got a hand up for a second Uh, so we live in a climate where people are again using their voices to push back against sexual harassment, and this time powerful men are being held accountable. Those who have continued to support these perpetrators by casting them as good people and attempting to silence their accusers by calling them liars appears reprehensible. How do your efforts here differ from the defenders of the accused? Well, that's a good, that's a good question, because um, of course I'm very upset about all the harassment that's been going on. It's been going on for years and years. Um, I, don't think, uh, it's, I don't think it's the same thing. Um, first of all, he did not touch any of them. Whoops, he did not touch any of them. He did not try himself to convert anyone. As far as I know, nobody got converted. So I don't quite see the parallel. I mean, he didn't do anything. He didn't have slaves. He didn't take any women. He didn't, it's, it's not exactly an exact kind of correspondence that I can see. Hey, I had a question about the kind of format of the event tonight. So as a scholar, I believe you know the importance of critical thinking dialogue. In light of the national conversation about Columbus and his legacy, we would have liked to see a similar conversation facilitated on this campus. We were told that you only agreed to a lectured style event. What are your thoughts about critical thinking dialogues and why do we not have such an event tonight? Thank you. I had heard about that um, idea and I would be happy to come back and have another kind of debate if, you, if that's what you would like. But I think that there were things in the lecture and in my book that you've never heard about. For instance, Columbus being a monk. Columbus never had slaves. And I wanted to, and probably never even heard about the whole business about the crusade. And that's his whole motivation. And if you don't know that, 
you don't understand the person. And so I wanted to be able to talk about that and let people know what was behind this, whereas having a debate, none of that would have come out. None of it. I can't see how it possibly would, and that's why I agreed to do this. And I'm happy to come back again, if you would like, um, anytime, and we could discuss uh, more informally. That'd be great. You, previously, you had just stated that his intent was not to convert them, but this flies in the face of your previous arguments. He had sent friars back to Hispania to, or Hispanoli, excuse me, to convert them. And although he was not the direct person to baptize them, that does not excuse him. He was by association guilty of taking part in this conversion. It was even part was of trying, the, yeah. their souls. Yes, he wanted to save their souls. That's true. But as I told you, that the friar never converted anybody. He didn't do anything and he went back home. That ignores my statement, though. No. I had stated that he was guilty by association since he was the one that had said, yes, we must send friars to Hispaniola to convert them and save their souls, which you cannot deny is conversion. When that is spoken to save their souls, that is meant to say that you are turning someone from not Christian to Christian in order to find them good in the eyes of Christ. But remember that he thought he was on the periphery of the Grand... He thought that these people were part of the Grand Khan's empire. He hadn't reached the Grand Khan yet, but he thought he was going to any minute. So he thought that the, the Grand Khan had asked for friars to convert them. Remember? When, when, did, when, when did you bring up the fact that he had believed that the Grand Khan had asked them to bring friars? I do not remember this part of your argument. Yeah, right at the beginning. That when Marco Polo and, and the Franciscans had gone, the Grand Khan had asked that they send friars to convert to teach and convert them uh, about the faith, because the Grand Khan was very interested in Christianity, according to Marco Polo and the Franciscans. I mean, uh, And was know. this Grand Khan the legitimate Grand Khan that he initially sought out to, and not the Grand Khan that he mistook as the native tribe leader? He, ideas? he did not mistake anyone for the Grand Khan. I'm just saying that he thought this was the periphery of the Grand Khan's <laughs> area. No, he never met the Grand Khan. Never thought he had. Mm -mm. Else? I, I just ha I just have a brief comment. I'm I'm really largely unfamiliar with um, your work here uh, uh, on this topic. Um, uh, in any case, I just wanted to thank you for making it a little bit more difficult to choose between Indigenous Peoples Day and Columbus Day because that's a problem that choice. And while I would like to hear uh, um, you argue things in a different manner at times. Um, I, I appreciate uh, you, again, complicating uh, with your historiography this issue that we all need to get further complicated by. Um, yeah, that's all. I guess I would like to add, I think we need to do a lot more than just have an Indigenous Peoples Day. I really think all over the country, we need to learn more about the natives who are living in our midst. My and point is that each day is a joke, and it's, it's uh, very symbolic of uh, our, uh, our ignorance. Thank you. Uh, I had an, another question, this one kind of about power and consent. So you talked about that the um, indigenous people consented to Columbus taking them. Um, I was wondering how can we trust Columbus's words with different factors present, including the threat of violence with all the weapons they had, as well as the inherent power the Europeans had coming over and the native people when they got there, in terms of exchanging gifts, there were accounts that they thought there were gods and people kind of look up to because they never seen like white skin before. So with those different factors of power at play and coercion, um, the, the Europeans coerced the native people, how can we kind of trust that account that what Columbus said was consent was actually consent? I don't know that we can ever say anything like that, but I mean, he and the chief were obviously friends, it's very clear. And that comes across from a lot of the different things that have been written. Um, and one of them was the chief's relative. It may have even been his son. And it's hard to imagine that the chief would let his son go across the ocean with some guy that he didn't like. 
And it seemed to me that everything that I've heard, that he and the chief, at least Guacanagari, they got along very well and were very good friends. And um, I don't know whether there was consent. He said lots more wanted to go. We don't know that, of course. But the idea, the fact that one of them wanted to stay, he liked being at, at the court in Spain, he decided to stay. And I'm not sure, there, there may have been another one who also stayed, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, he had that choice too. I don't think they were coerced, the six that he took back. So, recognizing that Columbus never set foot on U.S. soil, can we both agree on that? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So, sh like, recognizing that, should we actually be investing all this time and energy celebrating him when he never set foot on this soil? Well, he did set foot on the north coast of South America, yes. But U.S. soil, Not I'm talking US. about. But why because does we, Amerigo de, de Vespucci, then he gets to, you know, give them names to America. But... My like he didn't either. My question is the like why this is the only this is one of the only people that we celebrate in the U.S. who has not set foot here besides Christmas when we celebrate Jesus Christ. But this is the only p other person who we celebrate that never set foot on this on this soil. So why should we be investing all this time in celebrating a man who never stepped foot here? <laughs> but it's not a national holiday that we have a day off in. Well, except for the native, uh, native peoples, the rest of us would not be here. We wouldn't be here. Wait, can you please restate that? Except for the, the native peoples were already living here, right? Yes. But with Columbus's voyage, more and more people started coming, and we are all somehow uh, the recipients of that voyage. Well, but... <laughs> Except for the native peoples, yeah. But you also stated that if it wasn't for Columbus, other uh, explorers would have come here already. They, not already, they would have come later. Well, they would have come later on. Yeah, right. So I'm, I'm confused by that statement. He's the first one who crossed the ocean. That's, and, and came. So why are we... But this For the fourth part of the world, I guess. Okay, I understand that you pre you celebrate him, but why do we celebrate it as as the United States of America? Why do we celebrate him? I guess uh, I keep re reiterating because he crossed the ocean and found that there were a, there was a whole bunch of lands, islands, continents between Europe and Asia. But if Columbus never existed, let's, let's do hypotheticals, if Columbus never existed and these other explorers came... We would have made a day for them, probably. We like days. We would have had, we would have had a Vespucci day or somebody else. Um, so would you agree that Columbus stands as... Um, a symbol for the colonization of North America. That is believe what I... I think that's what he's become. In, in this, in All right, and would you agree that the colonization of North America uh, resulted in <laughs> the destruction of um, the indigenous peoples and their culture and um, their, ultimately their lives? Do you think... Uh, many of them, excuse me. This continent, this country, would have remained only for the Native Americans. Somebody is going to come here. Somebody at some point. Whether but else. that doesn't excuse the actions that resulted from um, Columbus's voyage over here. Um, I think a lot of this uh, debate comes down to questions over intent, over action. It's always I think. It's impact over intent. Intent. Have terrible results. That is, there's no question. I think he had very good intentions. And I think there were bad things that happened. Do you negate that the impact was negative? I think it was very hard. Yes. And there was a lot of disease. And people died from disease. On the other hand, the natives apparently had something called yaws, which when the men 
uh, when the men contracted it, it turned into syphilis, which then spread like wildfire across Europe. Also, tobacco was given. So you don't find it problematic that we have a holiday to celebrate the man that embodies the colonization of North America, but we don't have a holiday that celebrates the people who lived here even before? We should have a day. I've said that so many times. We should have a day. We should have a year, a week, a month. Um, but I also think because he did cross the ocean, and I think his intentions were good. I think his relations with the people were good. And could have been a lot of the conquistadors. Had the conquistadors come first, I would totally agree. Carol. Thank you so much for your talk. It was um, very interesting and illuminating. Um, I have a couple of points and questions. The first one is about uh, Italian Americans. Um, I, I hear the voice of Italian Americans and I think that obviously we would be silly to ignore the persecution that they paced throughout US history, but I've heard nothing from you about why he's an icon for Italy. I hear repeatedly about Spain, so can you address why he's a symbol for Italian Americans? That's my first question. Then my second question is more of a comment that leads to a question. Um, what does it mean to Roger Williams University? Um, a university that's named for a man who violently opposes converting indigenous people. I mean, he writes at length in A Key into the Language of America, in Christians Make Not Christians, in The Bloody Tenant, in private correspondence when he says forced conversion stinks in God's nostrils. So for a colony that then later becomes a state of Rhode Island and Providence plantations that is founded on um, religious freedom and a university named after Roger Williams who himself enslaves indigenous peoples in 1676, how can we celebrate Columbus? In, in, in if your point is about religious conversion, when our namesake is, is strongly against that. I mean, he writes openly, he writes in code about it. I mean, it's, it's letters, it's, di it's everywhere that Roger Williams does not want conversion. So how can this university set, do that? So Roger Williams did not want people to be converted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. He f was so deeply religious and so humble that he was one of he was he was in a very strong position to convert indigenous peoples. He felt that they had to come to their own realization, and he feels that they're equal. He completely respects their religion. Two things to that. First of all, it's a totally different era and time. Uh, but I was reading your journal article, and you um, in not in the book, but in the journal article that came out around the same time, that you compare this to the Puritans, right? The Pilgrims and Puritans who had come over in the 1620s, the very people who wanted to banish and perhaps execute Williams. So the views do persist, right? The end of the world, they've got to convert everybody there, the people in Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay. Mm -hmm, yeah, I mean, that's why it matters so much to this university. Perhaps that's something you and I could have a dialogue about, why it matters so much. To Oh, he, well, he, he's, he doesn't own slaves. He's against perpetual slavery. Um, he enslaves indigenous people in the wake of King Philip's War. He signs his name big and bold first. It complicates our understanding. I'm, I'm all for that. So it matters even more, I think, to us that we acknowledge the indigenous people that our namesake did so well by for most of his life. Yeah. So I don't, what, what do you think about that point about Roger Williams? And then perhaps you can address my point about doing stuff at Italy. I can suggest some sources. Sorry, I guess because uh, Columbus was Italian is why um, Italian Americans are, you know, taking up his case. That's okay. So we've had a very lengthy conversation. Okay. Okay, Autumn. Um, hi, uh, I'm a, a Latin American historian and uh, with a specialty in the Caribbean and the Dominican Republic. And so I, I have a question about uh, your methodology, just uh, wanting to understand when you're reading uh, Columbus's journals, are they in Italian or are they in Spanish? They're in Spanish. 
He, he ne the, no, there was no written Italian at that point. There were only a okay. few lines of Genoese. Mostly he wrote in either Latin or Spanish. Right. So I'm just trying to understand this and also as as a student in Spain, you know. Obviously, obviously. Um, and as students keep asking about these questions uh, about uh, enslavement and whatnot, so I just want you to, I wonder if you could clarify if he was using the requerimiento system. The what? The requerimiento system, which was a part of uh, what Queen Isabella had uh, asked and uh, had enforced as people were going across the ocean, beginning with Columbus's um, voyages. The requirement though is, is the, the, the requirement, so the reading of uh, when you come into contact with persons in the new world about conversion. Um, and so was that uh, at all in, in his journals? I don't know. I have not seen anything. I haven't seen, right. And this is, I think this is interesting because I had a... Uh, but she wouldn't have done, done that until after he'd already been here, right? Um, no, it was um, done before. Um, so Charlotte and I both have a student that worked on a project that uh, was a course of microcosm, a very small version of your book. It's, but all of this is very interesting in having the students understand the time period uh, that influences the people um, as they were coming over. So we had a student that was, was at Columbus or Cortez? That she, I think it was Cortez but trying to understand the, the late 15th century and what was going to drive the actions of brutality and enslavement and whatnot. Cortez was definitely... Obviously, a, obviously. A different type of person altogether. Yeah. yeah. I just want to congratulate us all for having a very difficult conversation in the sense of being a very difficult topic and, uh, and, and doing it in a very civil fashion. I think uh, we, we're showing America how you take up these questions. We're not done. There's more to come. But this was an important part of what we had to say. And I want to hand the microphone over to uh, Mr. Gabelli, who wants just to say a few words. You know, I, I have uh, listened to many professors who've done a lot of work. And thank you for your work and the effort, but also the achievement that you've accomplished. I'm also very proud of all of the students at Roger Williams. I think the notion and a world in which we have seen less civility in dialogue over the last uh, several years, that we have the right dialogue here tonight. The notion of coming out with your judgment and your concerns and your feelings is very important. Uh, what I do for the last <clears throat> 50 years is research. That's what I do. I'm an analyst. I read companies, and when I come to a decision on a company, I always like to listen to everyone's point of view, whether they're short the stock or long the stock. And don't make it sound so mercantile, but it is what I do. And essentially, what I like to hear is your opinions, and I'm delighted that you are hearing more about certain aspects of the individual. I think you also bring up good points about the Italo-Americans and go back and read about what happened in 1891 and why 1892 became the, the uh, earmark by Governor Cleveland and not my point of view of bringing that to the table. But I'm also in a very practical economic way. Anyone that signed up for a book, I'm going to give you a free copy. <laughs> so, and the reason for that is that you should learn about the details just to get one facet, and if you have a book that you'd like to share, I will read it as well. So please send me what you have. You quoted somebody, uh, but I, on any subject at any time. And thank you very much, uh, for President, uh, on that note. So thanks for everyone for being here. And thank you, students.